America. Starring Henry Fonda in Big Boy Blue on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. But first, here is Gain Whitman. Before our play begins this evening, I'd like to remind you of an old friend, DuPont's rug anchor, rug underlay, which is again available for household use. Safety experts tell us that more serious accidents happen in our own homes than on the highways. They are caused by the little things you may overlook, hazards that can easily be eliminated. A very real danger is small rugs that may suddenly skid over the polished floors and topple you headlong to the floor. For safety's sake, use DuPont's rug anchor, the synthetic sponge rubber non-skid underlay designed to make rugs stay put. It can be trimmed to fit any rug. Remember the name. It's Rug Anchor, one of DuPont's better things for better living through chemistry. The DuPont Company presents Big Boy Blue, starring Henry Fonda as Eugene Field on The Cavalcade of America. It is the day in 1873. President Grant is in the White House. Steamboats flourish on the Mississippi. But St. Louis is beginning to be ambitious about becoming the country's greatest railroad terminal. And at the moment, a long and unbelievably lean young man walks hesitantly into the editorial rooms of the St. Louis Evening Journal. Uh, looking for somebody, son? Sir? Oh, yes, sir. I'd like to see the editor about getting a position. <laughs> No positions on this paper, son. Only jobs. Have to see the old man, Mr. Cochran. Cochran? Yeah, yeah. See that uh, cat sitting down there? Oh, uh, yes, sir. Well, go down there and turn right. The mouse that cat happens to be watching. That's Cochran. Oh, thank you very much, sir. Hmm. He does look like a mouse at that. I should have brought a piece of cheese. Hello, Thomas. Nice kitty. Now, stop petting that cat and come here. Oh, yes, sir. Among those present was Senator Carl Schurz, who spoke briefly. Hey, what did he say? That should be the lead. Hey, boy, where's the man who wrote this story? Well, uh, hey, What's the matter? That cat got your tongue? I don't know, sir. That is, I mean, I don't know who wrote the story. Yeah, they call themselves reporters. Ah, I couldn't sharpen pencils for a good reporter in my day. Well, could they? No, sir. Of course couldn't. I'll tell you sometimes I don't know how I stand it. Mr. Cocker, my name's Eugene Field. I'd like to talk You're to you about... You're making me old before my time. Here, boy, run down and get me some coffee, will you? But, Mr. Cochran, I came to see you by getting Get a move it. on, will you? Yes, sir. Well, that's your lead, see? Have you got it straight now, or do I have to draw a diagram for I, you? I got it, Chief. I'll rewrite it the way you say it. I have to take him by the hand. <laughs> Call themselves reporters. Well, what do you want? Here's your coffee, Mr. Cochran. Huh? Oh, oh, yes, coffee. Here, nickel for yourself. Oh, no, thank you, Mr. Cochran. No, take it, take it. Hmm. That's good coffee. If it wasn't for coffee, I don't know what to do. Yeah, I'm a great coffee drinker myself, Mr. Cochran. I must drink 20 cups a day. I sometimes have six or eight. Never bothers me. Doesn't bother me either. People say it keeps you awake. My reporters drink it. Does that keep them awake? No. A lot of Tommy rot, I say. Hey, wait a minute. Who told you to sit down? Nobody. I just thought... Get back to your job, boy. But, Mr. Cochran, I don't work here. You don't work here? Didn't I just send you out for coffee? Yes, sir, but I really came here looking for a position. A uh, position? My name's Eugene Field, and I like to be a reporter on the journal, if there's an opening. <laughs> I sent you out for coffee. <laughs> and what field are you? Well, my father was Roswell Field, the lawyer. Oh, Red Scott case, huh? I knew him. Fine man. Yes, sir. Mr. Cochran, I'd certainly like to be a reporter. I just want a chance. I'd work for almost nothing. For nothing? That's no way to ask for a job, Field. When I hire a man, I pay him a salary. You ever done any writing? Oh, yes, sir. Quite a bit in, in college. <laughs> college? I wrote some verse. We've got no opening for a poet, Field. Better try something else. I'm a busy man. Good day. Oh, just a minute, Mr. Cochran. I'm no poet. I, I said I wanted to be a reporter. I want to cover fires and murders. I can write, see? And I not only want a job, I want... I want to... Eighteen dollars a week. Eighteen dollars a week? I won't go a cent above fifteen. Split the difference. It's fifteen or nothing. All right, fifteen. I'll start tomorrow morning. Goodbye, Mr. Cochran. Thanks very much. Eighteen dollars a week. The very idea. Eh, guess I squashed that all right. Nobody's telling me how to run my... 
Good Lord, I've hired a blame poet. It's a wonderful opportunity, Julie. It's the best job a man could have. You do all kinds of interesting things. You go to fires, report murders. Sometimes you get to write a review of a play. Oh, I'm so happy for you, Eugene. Oh, darling, we'll get married right away, won't we? I want to. Well, then we will. What's to stop us? Well, for one thing, father. Your father? What possible objection could he have? Oh, father thinks you're rather, well, frivolous. Frivolous? Well, whatever gave him that idea? Well, if only I hadn't seen you with the boys yesterday flying kites. Oh, but it's fun to fly kites, Julia. Oh, Eugene, I wouldn't change it for the world. I want you to be just the way you are. But Father... Uh, I'm sure he won't give his consent. Nonsense, Julia. He'll be delighted. Well, go on and talk to him right now. I know just how to handle him. I hope you're right. Oh, don't you worry. Hey, there he is, reading his paper. That's a good time to approach him. Mother's with him. All the better. Come along, Julia. All right. Well, well, Mrs. Comstock and Mr. Comstock. Well, hello, children. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Field. You're looking extremely well, Mrs. Comstock. Thank you, Eugene. Oh, uh, uh, would you like to have one of these nice, shiny apples? Oh, thank you. And uh, may I say that I've never seen you looking more fit. Uh, Father? What's that? Oh, I beg your pardon, sir. You see... Julie and I are some news for you, Walt. We want to be the first to know. We're going to be married. You're going to be what? Oh, you take the... Stop talking with a mouthful of apple. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, we're going to be married, Mr. Comstock. Married? Julia, dear, what does this mean? We want to get married, Mother. Nonsense. It's out of the question. Out of the question? Why, Father? Because in the first place, Julia, you're much too young. Oh, I'm almost 17, Julia, Father. Julia, I will do the talking. Yes, Father. Come, Julia. Father will handle this matter. Oh, but Mother... Come along, dear. Mr. Comstock, Julia is almost 17. I am 23. All authorities agree that the man should be five or six years older than the girl, so we can dismiss that objection. We cannot dismiss that objection. Very well, we'll come back to it. Any others? A great many. What is your weekly wage, Mr. Field? Well, in practically no time at all, I expect to be making $20 a week. What do you make now? Um... Fifteen. Of course, that doesn't include my outside writing, magazines and books, you know. Fifteen dollars a week. And how much does your magazine and book writing bring you? Oh, there's a fortune to be made in that line, Mr. Comstock. I see. And what part of that fortune are you presently receiving? I have some great ideas, Mr. Comstock. Uh -huh. We might say, then, that you propose to take on the responsibilities of marriage on fifteen dollars a week. No, and for the time being. But as I say, Mr. Comstock, I have some great ideas for magazines. No, I they... cannot give my consent to this marriage. Uh, Mr. Comstock, let me put it Just this Just a way. moment, Field. I have another objection. Another one? Field, a grown man, doesn't go around flying kites and playing practical jokes. He doesn't look upon life as some kind of game. Life is a serious business. And you don't consider me to be serious enough? I do not. Now, look, my boy, I don't want to be too hard on you. You settle down, make good on the newspaper, and then in, say, two or three weeks, we'll talk about this marriage again. That will be all. I'm reading my paper. Mr. Comstock, you force me to play my trump card. If you don't give your consent to this marriage now, I swear by all that's holy, I shall go on the stage as a juggler. Juggler. Mm, likely occupation for you. I shall go on the stage as a juggler, and moreover, I shall adopt your name. <laughs> what? Yes, sir. Edgar Comstock. And my first engagement will be at the Grand Opera House. You're mad, Field. How'd you like to have your name plastered on every barn and fence and vacant building in this town? I almost believe you'd do it. I intend to do it. Preposterous. It's blackmail. Oh, Mr. Comstock, I love Julia. I'll never make her unhappy. Please, sir, give us your blessing. No, absolutely no. Very well, sir. Stop juggling those apples. Now, appearing at the St. Louis Opera House, Edgar Comstock... Juggler. All right, all right. Thank you, Father. And I hope you'll be very happy. Mother? Yes, dear. Mother, where could he be? Now, don't worry, Julia, oh. dear. Eugene will be here any minute now. Something may have happened. An accident. Uh, he's 45 minutes late now. Well, there there must be a reason. He'll be here any minute oh, now. If anything's I know. happened, I'll, I'll die. I wish they'd stop that infernal organ. 
Mother, I know I never should have consented to this marriage. Now, Edgar... That young man is completely irresponsible. He's not, Father. He's not. I'd just like to get my hands on him, embarrassing everybody like this, leaving my daughter waiting at the church. Knuckle down, Mr. Field. Knuckle down. No fudging, Mr. Field. Mm, that's a mighty nice Aggie you got there. Watch me plink it right out of this circle. Wow. Oh, boy, some shooting. You sure do shoot a fine game of marbles, Mr. Field. Why, you're the best nib shooter I've ever seen. Now I'm going to pick off that nice carnelian. Mr. Field, why are you dressed up so funny? In that long coat and tile hat? Oh, I'm going to a wedding. To a wedding, huh? Who's getting married? I am. You're getting married? When? At 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock? Oh, my gosh, I'm late for my own wedding. Mr. Phil, come back. You have your marble. <laughs> oh, there, there, darling. Mother and father are standing by you. Oh, but, but to be left waiting at the church... Horrible. Perhaps it's all for the best. I suggest we pile back into the carriage and go home. Julia! Oh, Eugene! Oh, Julia, I'm so sorry, darling. Field, where have you been? I was uh, delayed, sir. That's obvious. Eugene, whatever happened? Oh, I'm terribly sorry, Julia, darling. Please forgive me. Of course, but what kept you so long? Well, I... Julia, I was getting a, a story uh, about the younger generation. Mr. Field! Mr. Field! Uh-oh. Mr. Field, you ran off and forgot to pick up your Marbles? Marbles? Field, you've been playing marbles while we've been waiting at the church. Oh, Edgar, Edgar, they're starting the wedding march. Field, I've got a good notion to call this whole thing off. Uh-uh. Careful, Father Comstock. I wish to remind you I am an accomplished juggler. Uh, Would you like a demonstration? No, not here, you fool. Edgar, come on, Father. Get in step. And do try to look pleasant. <laughs> Where's Field? Right here, Mr. Cochran. Yes, sir. Ah. Oh, well, Field, sit down. Sit down. Thank you, Mr. Cochran. Field, I don't mind telling you you've been doing pretty fair work. Thank you, sir. I believe in rewarding good work. I'm going to get a raise, sir. Raise? Who said anything about a raise? Well, I merely thought I... The reward I'm referring to is an assignment that I... Field, what in the world have you got on your feet? On my feet? Oh, oh those are carpet slippers, sir. Carpet slippers? What's the idea of wearing carpet slippers in the office? Oh, they're very comfortable, sir. You ought to try it. I never heard of such a thing. Field, you've got to have some dignity. The Evening Journal insists that its staff maintain it. Uh, carpet slippers, huh? Can you get me a pair like that? Why, certainly, Mr. Cochran. Well, get me a pair. My corns have been giving me the very devil. And don't say anything about it. This is strictly between you and me, Field. Yes, sir. Now then, about that raise. It raise? What raise? Well, you see, sir, we're going to have a baby at our house. That's no concern of the Evening Journal. There's no raise. Now get out of here. Yes, sir. Nerve of that fella. Going to have a baby, eh? Huh. Uh, uh, Field? Yes, sir? Two fifty a week. Thanks, Mr. Cochran. <laughs> listening to Henry Fonda as Eugene Field in Big Boy Blue on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. As our second act begins, we find the years have rolled by and Eugene Field is the proud father of a young son named Melvin. Daddy, please play with me. Well, son, what should we play? Daddy's busy, Melvin. He can play with you tomorrow. Oh, now, Julia. Melvin, say goodnight to Daddy now. Run along to bed. Good night, Daddy. Good night, son. You're sure you mailed my letter? What letter? Daddy, the letter to Santa Claus. Oh, that, of course I did, Melvin. I did better than that. I took it to the post office myself, and I told the postmaster, rush this through to the North Pole. And I wrote important on the envelope. You're sure it will get there on time? <laughs> I know it will, son. Don't worry about it. All right, Daddy. Good night. Good night, son. <laughs> Come along, dear. I count my treasure ore with care, a little toy my darling knew, a little sock of faded hue, a little lock of golden hair. Long years ago, this Christmas, long years ago, this 
Christmas. It's holy time. What are you working on, Eugene? Hmm? Oh, just scribbling, dear. May I look? Oh, it's just some doggerel, Julia. What? Oh, Eugene, that's nice. Go on with it. Oh, I don't know. Please, dear, finish it. Well, all right, just for fun. A little sock, a little toy, a little lock of golden hair. The Christmas music on the air. A watch I'm watching for my baby boy. But if again that angel train and golden head come back to me, to bear me to eternity, my watching will not be in vain. Uh, Field, come over here. Yes, sir, Mr. Cochran. Field, did you write this verse, Christmas Treasures? Well, in a way. Well, what do you mean in a way? You either wrote it or you didn't. Yes. I wrote it, Mr. Cochran. <laughs> so you're a poet after all. I am not. I'm a newspaper man. I just happened to write that thing at home last night. I just put it on your desk because my wife asked me to. It won't happen again. Now, if you'll give it back to me, please, I'll... Now, wait a minute, Field. Don't get excited. Suppose I tell you I might print this and pay you space rates for it. You mean you like it? Not particularly, Field. But it's a kind of sentimental slush that'll make every woman in town ball her eyes out. Sure, I'll print it. Oh, thanks. My wife will be pleased. Phil, you like kids, don't you? Not all of them. Well, you've got a flair for writing about them. Ought to keep on with that poetry. You might get someplace with it. I don't know, Mr. Stone. I'd, I'd like to work for you, but... To Chicago, that's a big jump. And a big opportunity for you. I intend to give you a column of your own. A column of my own? You can write all the poetry you like. Uh, even so, I'd want a contract. Naturally. And I'd want $50 a week for the first year, $50.50 .50 a week for the second year. $50.50 .50 the second year? Why the 50 cents? I want to feel that I'm making progress. <laughs> all right, Phil, it's agreed. I'll be looking for you in Chicago. Sure thing, son. Say, you want me to fix your little toy dog? Let's have a battle with the toy soldiers. Okay, a battle it'll be. I'll be the infantry, you can be the artillery. <laughs> I'll set up the cannon. Now, wait a bit. Oh, i got to get my troops deployed. All right. Oh, Daddy. Yes, son? Did you think of a Sunday school text for me? A Bible text? Oh, yes. Yeah, you did ask me for one, didn't you? All right, I'll think up one for you. Well, my army's all in position. The battle is on. Boom, boom, boom. Bang, boom. bang, bang. I knocked them all down that time. Boom, well, I'm boom, bringing boom. up reserves. Bang, 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 bang. Boys, <laughs> <laughs> boys. What's uh, going on here? Just a minor, major battle, dear. I'm winning, Mama. Boom, boom, ah, boom. Surrender, surrender. I give up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boys, if you don't stop that racket, the people downstairs will be rapping on the ceiling with a broom. Come on now. Way past Melvin's bedtime. And Eugene, you've got to look over these bills. Oh, yes, yes, Bill, Bill, Bill. <laughs> Kiss Daddy goodnight. Good night, son. Good night, Daddy. Come along now, son. Uh, how can I ever do it? Rent, 30, butcher, 28, 90. Daddy, uh, did you think of a Bible text for Sunday school? A Bible text? Oh, yes. Uh, well, let's see. Just say, the Lord will provide, my father can't. <laughs> Stone has us on the carpet for. Yeah, with Christmas next week, maybe we get a boost. <laughs> Only boost we'll get from Stone will be through the door. Good morning, boys. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Hi, boys. Stone. Boys, I'm happy to announce that the paper is giving each and every one of you a fine turkey for Christmas. Oh, turkey? Well, 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 what's the matter, Phil? Doesn't the turkey suit you? Oh, yes, sir, but a little extra in the pay envelope would be better. What I need is a new suit. Oh, you want a suit, eh? Very well, I'll see that you get one. Yes, indeed. Uh, Merry Christmas, everybody. Yeah, Merry Christmas. 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 Mm -hmm. Gangway, out of the way with that broom, friend. Hey, <laughs> Gene, where did you get that convict suit? Mr. Stone gave it to me for Christmas. The old man gave you that? <laughs> Oh, Gene, that's one time Stone got the best of you. And I must say, stripes become you. <laughs> Gee, 
She's more to be pitied and censored. She's more to be helped and despised. I beg pardon. Could someone direct me to the office of Mr. Stone? Well, who shall I tell him is calling, sir? I am Mr. Harrow, editor of the Springfield Journal. My goodness. Yes, sir? You were saying? Oh, those, those stripes. You're a convict. Well, sir... Oh, what are you doing here? Oh, don't be alarmed, my dear sir. I am quite harmless. So, Editor Stone is a personal friend of the warden, eh? And he has the warden send convicts over to perform menial tasks about the office. Oh, well, if Mr. Stone likes to save a dollar whenever he can... Oh, it's disgraceful. Uh, oh, we don't mind. We really enjoy a change of scenery now and then. Using convicts' labor in a newspaper office. <laughs> well, hello, Mr. Harrell. Welcome to Chicago. Mr. Stone... During my years as an editor, I have encountered graft and chicanery. But you, sir, are the epitome of corruption. Well, what are you talking about? Working convict labor in your office. But, Mr. I Harrow, shall I... shall expose you, sir. You, you slave trader. Good day, Mr. Stone. Mr. Harrow, you don't understand. Come back, Mr. Harrow. More to be pretty than something. Feel, take off that darn suit. I could wring your infernal neck. Would you ever have a serious moment? Not if I can help it, Mr. Stone. She's more to me than Stone. Oh, Jean. Jean, I was afraid you wouldn't get here. Melvin's terribly ill. Ill? What's wrong, Julia? I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Terrible fever. He's delirious. The doctor's with him now. Come, Melvin's been calling for you. Oh, uh, Mr. Fields. Doctor, how is he? Exceedingly critical, sir. You can only stay a moment. Melvin? Melvin's son. Daddy. Daddy. Daddy's here to, to play with your son. I'm so tired, Daddy. It's bringing my little toy dog and my little toy soldier. I want to talk to them. Right here, son. I'll put him here right beside you. There, there you are. Now, don't you go till I come back. You don't make any noise. Hold me close, Daddy. I'm so sleepy. I'm so sleepy. Close your eyes, son. And rest your head. And dream of the land of winking and blinking and nod. Mm -hmm. Go to sleep. And when you wake, and you'll be well again. And we'll play with your toys. Tell me he's all right, Doctor. He's got to be all right. I'm sorry, Mr. Field. There's no use pretending. Only a miracle could save him now. The little toy dog is covered with dust, but sturdy and staunch he stands, and the little toy soldier is red with rust, and his musket molds in his hand. Time was when the little toy dog was new, and the soldier was passing fair, and that was the time when our little boy blue kissed them and put them there. Now, don't you go till I come, he said, and don't you make any noise. So, toddling off to his trundle bed, he dreamt of the pretty toys. And, as he was dreaming, an angel's song awakened our little boy blue. Oh, the years are many, the years are long, but the little toy friends are true. I, faithful to little boy blue, they stand, each in the same old place, awaiting the touch of a little hand smile of a little face, and they wonder, as waiting the long years through, in the dust of that little chair, what has become of our little boy, Blue? Since he kissed them and put them there.
Our star, Henry Fonda, will return to our cavalcade microphone in a moment. Now, here's Gaines Whitman. In the early days of automobiles, a car owner had a wrestling match on his hands every time he changed a tire. Many a driver was ready to swear that clincher rims were an invention of the devil. The four great steps in the improvement of automobile wheels and tires were pneumatic tires, demountable rims, all-steel wheels, and balloon tires. Now, tire manufacturers are announcing a fifth development, which may prove to be the greatest of all. Tires with rayon cords. Inside an automobile tire are thousands upon thousands of cords, side by side, vulcanized into the rubber. They are there for the same reason the barrel of a big gun is wound with steel wire. They give the tire its strength. Rayon is a man-made fiber, and the raw material used in making high-tenacity rayon gives it strength to begin with. Then, as it is spun, the rayon is stretched, which adds more strength. And finally, rayon cord gets stronger as it grows hotter. And as you know, tire cords do get hot when you're driving. So cords in rayon tires are actually stronger during use. The DuPont Company was first to develop high-tenacity rayon for tires. As long as 10 years ago, heavy-duty trucks and buses traveling at high speeds over broiling hot desert highways were testing tires made with DuPont Cordura high-tenacity rayon. Then, during the war, when the armed forces needed millions of tires, and it was found that casings made with synthetic rubber ran hotter, rayon cords became a necessity. Their record was so outstanding, so convincing beyond any doubt, that from now on, leading manufacturers plan to use rayon cords for passenger tires as well as tires for trucks and buses. Tires that will last for 50,000 miles or better may soon be commonplace, and they will give you a more comfortable ride. Cordura High Tenacity Rayon for Tires is one of the DuPont Company's better things for better living through chemistry. And now, here again is Henry Fonda. Next Monday night, your Cavalcade of America will bring you The Magnificent Meddler, starring George Sanders as Dr. Benjamin Rush. It's the story of a Philadelphia doctor's fight against 18th century superstition to establish America's first home for the mentally ill. I'll join you next Monday evening to hear George Sanders as Dr. Rush, The Magnificent Meddler. Music for tonight's DuPont Cavalcade was composed and conducted by Robert Armbruster. Our Cavalcade play was written by Gerald Holland. Henry Fonda is soon to be seen in the RKO radio production, Christabel Kane. This is Tom Collins inviting you to listen next week to George Sanders as Dr. Benjamin Rush in The Magnificent Meddler on The Cavalcade of America, brought to you by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. This is the National Broadcasting Company.